So whereas in the material world, you're forced to just focus in a very narrow way, anyone who's in contact with Krishna's service increases their abilities because the world of Krishna's service keeps increasing. So it's the most exciting life. <laughs> A you that you're not aware of manifests. First of all, sense control and discipline manifest. Kindness manifests. Gentleness manifests. Peace, inner peace manifests. And what to speak of, the highest spiritual knowledge. You indeed begin to practically experience that you are part of Krishna. And you feel Krishna's reciprocation through the chanting, through the kirtan, the japa, the prasad, especially when done in association with devotees, you start to come alive. <laughs> and that's what you really want. You don't want to be a phony. You don't want to waste your life and die with regrets. You want to solve the schizophrenia. Style. You want to solve uh, being with one foot in each world. Well, there are the family obligations and duties. Okay, okay, okay. Then there's what Bollywood is pushing me toward. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why waste your whole life going crazy that way? Why not learn how to handle the body and mind with bhakti skills? How to become the master of your mind and senses? And why not learn how to deal with the family obligations in a way that's progressive for both yourself and the family members? <laughs> These are the skills that a devotee knows. And in the course of a devotee's serving Krishna, you become equipped with skills and talents more than what you would ever expect. <laughs> You're plugging into the spiritual world. Actually, Krishna is the source of all talents, abilities, and skills. So instead of participating in a world which you may fear, I won't be able to express my God-given abilities. I'll be ignoring my potential. And I could regret it later. Oh, why did I spend so much time trying to be Krishna conscious? I didn't chase the material dream, and now I regret. It's not like that. The world of Krishna's service is ever increasing. It takes the best that you can give and more. The emotional dynamics, the inner dynamics of being a devotee. There's no comparison to it. Devotees are so full of life in serving Krishna. Not temporary material life. They're full of eternal spiritual life. They know how to lust. They know how to show greed. All for Krishna's pleasure. That's why you see them all as shining. And you can also be shining even more than you are now. <laughs> so I'd like you all to start visualizing your career as someone increasing their commitment and involvement with Krishna's service. Somehow or other, <laughs> start visualizing. That is actually my real career. <laughs> to some extent, somehow or other, increase your spiritual commitment, increase your devotional involvement. Somehow or other, this way, that way, that's your real career. And then you'll see the spiritual lust and greed develop.
which gives such pleasure to Krishna. Please consider this. Your future is in your hands. <laughs> We've spoken about the pressures. The pressures from the world of duty and obligation, the pressures from the hedonistic world, <laughs> which is so popular these days. But we're presenting another option. <laughs> An option that will resolve the problems and pressures caused by those other two worlds. You'll learn how to handle both of those worlds easily with the skills that you learn in your bhakti career. So please consider this. I thank you very much. Hare Krishna. I am so grateful to be with all of you this evening. Special gratitude to His Holiness Devamrita Swami Maharaj for his brilliant, soul-searching, enlightening Harikata. Thank you. He transformed our hormones. <laughs> His, his words made our hormones dance. <laughs> Haraj was so beautifully speaking about not destroying the natural inclinations of the human heart, mind, and senses but transforming them. The Srimad Bhagavatam explains that when you put water on the root of the tree, that water reaches every part of the tree. And similarly, when we focus our body, our mind, our words, our desires, our greed, our lust, and all the other things that he was discussing, toward selfless service to Krishna or to God, then it has an opposite effect. Instead of entangling us in material um, complications, it liberates us. And just to add something to what he said, um, I'd like to offer some living examples throughout history, especially in Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes, which illustrate this. Lord Chaitanya is Krishna. The Vedic literatures tell us that in this age of Kali, once in a day of Brahma, Krishna appears in the role of his own devotee to teach us how it's practical, accessible to everyone to achieve this greatest of all treasures, the premadan, the purushartha siromani, the jewel of love of God. There was a king named Prataparudra. He was the undisputed king of the entire Orissan province, which in those days included Andhra Pradesh and that whole area. He was called the Gajapati. 
He was undefeatable. Even the time when there were uh, Mughal emperors conquering India, they could not penetrate his kingdom. In order to do that, you really have to have it together. He had armies, military, he had spies. That's what you need in those days when you have enemies all around you. He had economists. He had a massive treasury. He had laws. He had courts. And he didn't have to worry about elections. <laughs> I just came from America, and everyone, everywhere, is talking about elections. <laughs> and this happens every four years. Because really, you could be in a very powerful position, but you really don't know if you're going to have it beyond the next few years. And after eight years, you know you're out. But in the days of these monarchs, they come in, they're king, usually when they're teenagers, and for their whole life. So King Prataparudra was a very, very talented person. Materialistically, he was topmost. But then he heard from his teacher, his guru, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, that Krishna had appeared in this age of Kali as Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya was living in Jagannath Puri, which was his kingdom. Because Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya had such deep faith, and he had such realization of who Lord Chaitanya was, the king believed him immediately. He said, I need to meet him. Now when the king wants to meet a beggar, sannyasi, that's usually a great honor. But when Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya told Lord Chaitanya that King Prataparudra wants to meet you, the Lord said, I'm a Swami. And in those days, Swamis didn't meet kings. Sarvabhoma said, but he's not an ordinary king. He's a, he, he's a saint. He's a Rajarishi. Lord Shaitanya said, still, what will people think if I'm meeting people with so much money and so much power? When this news came to Prataparudra Maharaj, he said, it's not that he had to think about it really deeply. From the core of his heart, he immediately said, then I will give up my kingdom. If my kingdom, if my being a king is an impediment to meeting the Lord today, I'll not only give it up and give up my palace, I will live in the street like a homeless person and become a beggar. That will be my greatest treasure. That will be the greatest conquest of my life. And he meant it. And all the devotees around, they were very pleased to see his sincerity, but horrified because he was such a good king. He was so fair, so honorable, so protective, and he was running the kingdom so everyone was happy. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So they somehow or other tried to keep him as king and connect him somehow or other to get Lord Chaitanya's mercy, which they did. That's a long story. But the conclusion was King Prataparudra used his wealth, his intelligence, his popularity, influence everything for the purpose of pleasing the Lord, serving the Lord, and genuinely uplifting everyone's consciousness in a spirit of compassion. 
because he understood nothing is mine. Everything ultimately belongs to the Supreme Lord, to Krishna. Proprietorship means control. If you own a place, people can't just say, you have to get out. But in this world, our body, our homes, our wealth, our family, our abilities, our intelligence, at any moment it could be taken away. And inevitably at death it will be taken away. So it's never really ours. It's in our care. And this is the spiritually enlightened way of seeing this world. That whatever intelligence, abilities, wealth, influence, whatever there may be, it belongs to God, to Krishna, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, and it's in my care. And let me use it in harmony with the will of the, of the proprietor. That's bhakti. By using our talents and our gifts in this way, we are watering the root of the tree. And not only do we find the greatest satisfaction, but everyone. And there are so many beautiful stories about King Prataparudra, how he maintained his position, his family, his influence in pure dharma. To show the world that whatever position we are in, if we just harmonize it with the spirit of pure bhakti, it becomes the source of our own liberation and the source of liberation of the world. And then we have Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami. They were the prime minister and home minister, finance minister for the king of Bengal. They were so efficient and proficient in what they did that the king, who was a Mughal ruler at the time, he loved them like his younger brothers. He totally depended on their skills and their influence. And he literally shared the property of his kingdom with them. Their names were Dabir Khas and Sakar Malik at the time. He gave them vast tracts of land. They built palaces, beautiful lakes and forests. They had so much everything. Power, knowledge, wealth, popularity. But when they met Lord Chaitanya, they just wanted to serve him. And they left everything. They didn't take anything with them. They went to Vrindavan. And what did they wear? In order to get there, Sanatana Goswami had to be put in prison because he was leaving behind his prime minister duties <laughs> and he escaped from prison. And he was a f one day he's the prime minister of the whole country and the next day he's a fugitive by his own choice. Usually you're like that because you get caught doing something. <laughs> But he didn't do anything wrong by his choice. And when Rupa and Sanatana were living in Vrindavan, instead of royal garments, they were wearing simple loincloths. Instead of living in palatial mansions, they were sleeping on the ground, on the riverbank, or in the forest, under trees. They didn't have roofs over their heads. Instead of eating fine foods, they were just begging for some dry rotis. But they were always in the highest ecstasies of love of God. But interestingly, even when they were Goswamis, the crest jewel, highest example of renunciation 
they still utilized the skills and the things of this world, but without selfishness. If you go to Vrindavan, the most, the most beautiful, ancient, architecturally, magnificently designed temple in all of Vrindavan is Radha Govinda Temple. And that's even after it has been, you know, attacked by enemies over these centuries. It was built 500 years ago. It's still the most magnificent temple in Vrindavan. Hand-carved sandstone. Rupa Goswami inspired and designed that temple that still stands today. Not for himself, for the world so that Vrindavan would be a holy place so that millions of people for generations and generations to come would, would learn the art of bhakti. His Devamrita Swami Maharaj was talking about this lust and greed for Krishna. To build a temple like that, you have to have a vision. You have to have deep des desire. And and Sanatan Goswami's Madan Mohan temple, to this day, 500 years later, is the very symbol of Vrindavan, still standing. It's magnificent. And the books that they wrote, they didn't just sit around and, you know, wait till it was time to beg rotis. They were dynamic, they were empowered, they were enthusiastic, they had passion and greed for Krishna. Rupa Goswami wrote so many incredible literatures. The Bhakti Rasamrita, the Sindhu, the Vidagda Madhava, the Lalita Madhava, the Upadesha Amrita. Dozens and dozens of books, and their nephew Jiva Goswami wrote over a hundred thousand Sanskrit verses. And writing these books in those days, it wasn't like cutting and pasting, you know, from the internet. <laughs> you had to be enthusiastic to write a book in those days. It was intense. Just four days ago, I spoke at the Cambridge Union in Cambridge University, and the topic they gave me, I didn't think of it, they gave it to me. That's usually what happens in my life. <laughs> it was how simple it was in the days when apples and blackberries were just fruit. <laughs> And they, told, they asked me to speak on this book, The Journey Home. So I began by saying, you know, I, they thought of the topic because I wrote The Journey Home on an Apple computer. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the fruit, whatever it may be. <laughs> But in those days, to write a book, you had to go out and get palm leaves. You had to climb trees and pick palm leaves. So you had to get bark from trees, and, and you had to process it with natural herbs and with natural, you know, um, the sunlight and with water. It took a lot of time to process a leaf, so, it, so actually what you write on it, it's going to last. Then they had to carve with like, a, with like a special writing tool, carve the Sanskrit letters into the palm leaf. And then they had to get herbs from the ground that made a color and then fill in those carved marks so that it's actually like an ink from the ground. 
And when Lord Chaitanya saw one of the palm leaves of Rupa Goswami's writing, he started to cry. He was so amazed. He said, Rupa Goswami's handwriting is like rows of pearls. It's so beautiful, so artistic. Every single letter has such artistic value, such devotion, such thoughtfulness. And he's sitting, Vrindavan, in the summer, it gets sometimes 50 degrees Celsius. In the winter, it gets really, really cold, freezing cold. And he didn't have heater, he didn't have air conditioner, he didn't have fan. He was just under trees. It takes some serious enthusiasm and determination to write these books like that and to build temples like that and to excavate holy places that millions and millions of people are coming to in Vrindavan. They were the ones who excavated these places where Krishna had his leelas. So even though they were brahmachari swamis, ghost swamis of the highest order, still, they had such a passion. They had such a greed to serve. Their passion and their greed was compassion. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he didn't need anything. He wanted them to do all of this for the welfare of all humanity, for the welfare of all living beings, for generations and generations, centuries and all time to come. Their passion, their greed, was an expression of their love for you and for me. To give us the real treasure of life. Imagine, Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, they were what's equal today to be billionaires. They left all that. And in exchange, they got a treasure that was infinitely more valuable, a treasure that was infinitely more satisfying. And what was that treasure? Prema, love for Krishna. And what is the price of that treasure? Bhakti, our sincere devotion. They were tasting it. They were feeling it. They wanted to share it with the world. They saw how the world was so much mesmerized by all the glittering things that they had. And they wanted to show the world how all these beautiful glittering things that we had, they can be used in a way that actually bring us close to the real treasure of life. And don't distract us. The weapons of mass distraction are everywhere. Yes, in the renounced order, or in the worldly order of grihasta, whatever it may be, that passion to serve with love, with devotion, with compassion, is the greatest of all treasures. And it's something everyone could do. Just a few days ago in London, I spoke at the HSBC Bank, and the HSBC Bank leadership asked me to speak on the subject of the responsibility of having wealth. <laughs> I didn't even have to say it. The person that introduced me said, you know, we're asking Radhanath Swami to speak on the responsibility of, of having wealth, and he hasn't had a checking account since 1969. <laughs> 
And they looked at me like, oh. <laughs> I had to redefine wealth a little from their perspective. <laughs> It was, it was a wonderful reception. But the person who made the closing remarks after my talk was Alfred Brush Ford, who's one of my dear god brothers, who Srila Prabhupada named Ambarish. He's the great grandson of Henry Ford, who's the practically the founder pioneer of the entire automobile industry as, as we know it today. So, <laughs> people told me afterward that um, they said, you know this Mr. Ford, he sounded more like a swami than you do. And I had to admit, he actually did. <laughs> but he was, he was telling these directors and CEOs, and there were many British lords that were present, he was telling them about, uh, he, he spoke a lot of very realized, experienced wisdom of being in this world, but not of this world. And he was talking about how he's building this temple in glorification of Lord Chaitanya in Navadweep Mayapur. And how, you know, you know, he's taking literally tens and tens and tens and millions of his own dollars, and how for, for years, even with many impediments and disappointments, he just won't give up. Because Srila Prabhupada wanted this temple as a place where people from all over the world will be able to really understand and experience the true treasure of India's dharma, of India's spiritual culture, as Lord Chaitanya presented it. Prema Pumartha Mahan. The highest of all goals, the greatest of all treasures, is the awakening of the love for Krishna that is within the heart of every living being. And how this love for Krishna, Lord Chaitanya taught, can be realized, can be directly experienced, whoever we may be. If we understand this principle of yukta vairagya, how to utilize the gifts of this world in a spirit of seva, unselfish service, rather than selfish egoism, by watering the root of the tree. And how we can actually have this experience awaken in our heart if we learn the art, the science, of chanting the holy names of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Alfred Ford, the instruction, please build this temple for, for the world so that millions and millions of people from everywhere will come to really, to associate with, with, with people who can present the science of Sanatan Dharma, pure bhakti, and convince their hearts. Experience the treasure of this holy place. So since Srila Prabhupada has left 1977, Ambarish has been working and working and working, and now the temple, 
He's already put tens and millions of dollars. He's put about 30 years of practically his full attention. And you know what I was thinking? When he was speaking, I was thinking that Alfred Brush Ford has as much passion and greed to build this temple for Lord Chaitanya as his great-grandfather had to build Ford cars. <laughs> it's a fact. It's very, very practical. It's very simple. Devamrita Maharaj was talking about the brahmacharis being so enthusiastic with such strong desires. But the household ladies and gentlemen of our congregation have the same intense, strong desires. Some are industrialists, some are software engineers, some are students, some are professors, some are into engineering or politics, whatever it may be. Bhakti is a change of heart. <coughs> and expressing that change of heart in such a way that we can not only transform ourselves, our families, but we can be instruments in helping to transform the world to find the real fulfillment that everyone is seeking, that connection with the all-beautiful, all-sweet, supreme personality of Godhead. Thank you very much.